the the essence of this message is to the body of Christ, specifically those who profess to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Why? Because you need to know exactly what it is that God has available and wants available for you. And so when you examine the Bible, you want to examine who God is, what God wants for you as far as responsibility, what God wants to equip you with, what God wants to reward you with in this life and in the life to come. And so uh, when we look at the scriptures, we look at the the written word of God and, and the books that are written in this one library of books, we understand that God has a lot to say, especially as it relates to the power of His Spirit. Now, in a world of social media, where a lot of things can be said that are generalizations and that are overstatements, we have to be, we have to specify. You want to narrow down what God is saying because ultimately you and I are going to be judged by our reaction to the God that made us, to the Father of creation. Let's, so let's talk about the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the standard and model for every believer in God. Jesus Christ is the standard. In John 14, 6, he lets everyone who's following him know exactly where he stands on exclusivity. Is Jesus exclusive? Is his power, does it only come from him? Jesus says, I am the only way. I am the only truth. I am the only life. You can't inherit eternal life but by me. That means you have to put on my lifestyle. You have to embrace the sacrifice that I made for you. It's all through me. And so his ways and his works, his personality, all of these things are things that God wants you and I to walk in. In Romans chapter 8, verses 29, Romans 8, 29, you and I were created by God to be shaped like him, to be conformed into his very image. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, the word of God lets us know that Jesus went about all of Galilee, all of the neighboring areas. It says, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, which are Jewish assemblies, and preaching the gospel or the good news of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness, or all kind of sickness, and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, a Gentile area, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those which had the palsy, and he healed them. So Jesus' ministry wasn't just in word, it was in power. And that's what God wants for you. That's what God wants for me. He wants to have a ministry of power. Now, there are a lot of false spirits out there, and so you definitely want to know that what you're walking in is the power of the Spirit. And you can know that if you submit to the God of the Bible, by believing on his son, Jesus Christ, and asking Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to fill you with this power. And he says that if you ask him, he will give you that for which you ask, if you ask in faith, not doubting, and if you ask persistently. The, the Bible says it's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So don't be afraid of what you're going to get from God. He knows that whatever he gives to you, the Bible says the blessings of the Lord, they make rich and they add no sorrow thereto. So Jesus taught God's word in local assemblies. He proclaimed God's authority and revealed his standards in these large outdoor gatherings. He physically healed by the power of his spirit all kinds of sickness and disease. He brought deliverance from torment and he forced evil spirits to lead people. And these same abilities are available to the believer today. Jesus gives all those who believe on him the right and the ability to do his works. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, it says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against 
unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And that, that power, that strength, that ability, that authority is available to you and I today. And again, Jesus says if you ask in Matthew 7, you will receive, but you have to ask believing that that for which you're asking, he can give. And you also want to understand that this is for today. It wasn't just for ancient times. In Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, the word of God himself, Jesus Christ, lets you and I know that these are the power signs of every believer. Look at what it says. He says, and these signs are going to follow those who believe. He just makes that very general statement. These are the signs that are going to follow the believers. In my name, they're going to cast out devils. They're going to speak with new tongues. They're going to take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And then, of course, in John 14, 12, he makes that bold statement. He says, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. These are specifically the powers of God given to mankind through the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name that you and I can walk in in order to overcome the works of Satan and, and in order to overcome the works of the devil. Because the devil is real. He's out there manipulating people. He's out there deceiving people. And so God is giving his people power to overcome the, the devil's devices. Now, the power of God is for the work of the ministry, meaning once you give your life to Jesus Christ, you are required to deny yourself, your own passions, your own selfish ambitions, to take up the cross, which represents the ministry of Jesus to mankind, and to pursue Jesus for the rest of your life. Uh, the Holy Ghost is your power to do that. He says in Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 and 8, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, so freely give. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he makes clear. He says, this is how you're going to represent him by his power. He says, you're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost comes on you. So once you confess your sins to God, and you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart because you believe he died on the cross for your sins. You believe he resurrected by the power of God on the third day. God raised him from the dead. The Bible says if you believe that in your heart, you confess that with your mouth. It says that with your mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And with the heart, man believes on unto the point of righteousness for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's in Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 and the following verses. So the power of God is given to you so after you're born again you understand the mission of kingdom building and God wants to wants you to walk in that power where he uses you to build people from the inside from the inside out. Now let's talk about the error of men. Now listen it is possible to rebel against God even after he gives you his power and so you never want to find yourself in position where after God gives you his power that you turn back out into the world. In Matthew chapter 11 verses 20 and 21 Jesus rebuked many cities at least three that had received his miracle power meaning he went in there and did a lot of healing a lot of restoration but yet they didn't embrace him. Yet they embraced him temporarily. And when you and I embrace God on a temporary basis, what does that do? That leaves room for people who are watching our example to blaspheme God because they may disrespect the power that you and I may still be able to operate under. Even though our lifestyles, our personalities don't match with the fruit of the Spirit. So God, many times, will allow you to still operate in the gifts, even though the fruits are absent. Why? Because he loves the people whom you're serving. He loves them and sent you to help them. Uh, Hebrews 6 makes that clear. It says in verse 4, Hebrews 6, 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, this is not talking about any Luciferian light, this is the light of Jesus, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, 
and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, it's impossible to renew them again. And they, not saying that God can't do it. He's saying that you and I can't do it. It's impossible for you and I to go and evangelize somebody who's already been there, done that in the Holy Ghost. And they're just out there living now. The Word of God talks about a reprobate mind or a hardened state of mind or a hardened state of heart. You never want to find yourself there. In, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 27 and 29, he says, hey, if we, if we sin willfully, verse 26, Hebrews 10, 26 through 29, for if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. Hey, there's no more sacrifice for you and I. Jesus isn't going to come down again and die. So you have to turn back to that which you just forsook, seeing you crucified to yourself the Son of God afresh. Meaning, you basically said that the sacrifice he made for you wasn't valuable to you. And so you don't want to walk in rebellion after God's generosity in giving you his power. Having power to minister for God does not necessarily prove that a person is righteous. Look at Samson. He's an example of that. What we know about Samson's moral character wasn't good. He was into strange women. When I use the term strange, I use the term foreign. He was uh, into Philistine women, something that God did not want the children of Israel to partake in. And, and, and he ate things that were uh, on dead carcasses, the carcass of a lion. So Samson was rather disobedient. You can find that story in the book of Judges, I think, chapter 14 through 16. But Matthew 7, 21 and 22 says, not everybody, Jesus is saying, not everybody who professes him to be Lord out of their mouths are truly his disciples or are going to make it into eternal life. Do you want to find yourself there? So yes, God wants you to walk in his power. But having that power doesn't necessarily mean that you're in right standing. Because many are going to say, Lord, didn't I do these many wonderful works in your name? And he's going to say, I didn't know you. Jesus made a statement in John chapter 6, verse 20. He asked his disciples, he said, haven't I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? So it's possible to follow Jesus closely, because physically do all the religious works, but yet you're about to lose your soul. So you definitely don't want to find yourself there. But I also want to make this clear that human flaw does not invalidate the power of God. Just because people or ministers around you are flawed in their personalities, it doesn't mean that the power they're operating by is demonic. So what you do want to do is you want to ask God to divide for you, to show you exactly what you're dealing with when you're, uh, when you're having to decide where you should fellowship or who you should allow to pray for you. And so uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, Paul writes this, he says, But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. He's saying, is it God's fault that while you were pursuing him, while you were pursuing the Lord, you fell off and you backslid? He says in verse 18, for if I build again the things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. So he's saying that if you and I decide to rebel against God, it's not because of the Spirit of God led you into doing that. And so you want to distinguish between what God is doing and what the devil is doing, because you never want to cross, you never want to mix that. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, the Word of God says, even in my unbelief, God is still who he is. I can't invalidate his personality just because of any failures on my behalf. Now, the third dimension of this is we're going to talk about how the carnal mind can't comprehend spiritual things. And so there are many people that are on the Internet, that are in the secular world, the secular educational world, that will reject the power of God, reject the spirit of God, reject the truth of God. And you don't want to be among them because you misunderstand how the power is supposed to look. When it, when the spirit of the Lord moves on an individual. So there's been a lot of talk about the Kundalini spirit, which essentially is described as a serpent. The, the, the Hindu religion teaches that Kundalini is a serpent at the base of the human spine that through different yoga practices, this spirit can rise up and see through that individual. And it's supposed to give that person some sense of enlightenment. Now that's a demon spirit. It's a demon spirit. It's a devil. And 
it can cause a person to react a certain way that you as a general church corps might find, might look familiar. And there are other types of things that are going on in different churches that you may, that you may question, whether it's the gift of tongues or whether it's laughter or various things. And unless the Holy Ghost is affirming for you, or unless somebody just outright lets you know in some in no uncertain way that what they're doing they actually got from some Hindu swami or medicine man or that they actually conjured up something that, that is anti scriptural, anti Christ, then you definitely don't want to use their physical reactions to qualify or discredit what they're uh, you don't want to use their physical actions to qualify or discredit the influence, the spiritual influence they're under. In uh, carnal mind or, or the earthly, earthly minded person can't understand spiritual things. And in Matthew chapter 9, verse 34, the, the Pharisees thought Jesus was using devil power because he didn't keep certain expectations of their certain traditions or laws that they felt that he should have. They said he casts out devils by the prince of the devils. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 and 19, it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them who are dying and going to hell, to them it's foolishness. It says, But unto us who are saved, it's the power of God. The preaching of the gospel is the power of God released to you and I. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So God will allow foolish things to confuse those who are proud and arrogant in their intellect. So you don't want to find yourself there. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 14, Paul says this. He says, now we have not received the spirit of the world. So a worldly minded individual is going to judge something only by its exterior manifestation. And you don't want to find yourself there. You don't want to be careless when you're, when you're talking about spiritual things. It says, but the spirit, which is of God, or I'm sorry, it says, in verse 12, 2 Corinthians 2.12, Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know. It's important for you to know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So you want the Holy Ghost, not just information that... I may give, that any other ministry may give. You want to make sure the Spirit of God, consistent with the Word of God, is revealing truth to you. That's why it's important for you to be in a Bible-based, Spirit-led ministry where Jesus is still God, still Lord, still loving you. His Father is still active in transforming lives into the image and person of Jesus Christ. It says in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 2, the natural man can't receive the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness to him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So if you are not baptized in the Holy Ghost, if you have not been baptized in the Holy Ghost, then discerning him from an unclean spirit is going to be impossible, unless God is just extremely gracious to you and allows you to see it in some way before, because God does that. God can do anything. Many use human knowledge instead of the power of Jesus Christ when they preach. And so you don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. In, in Mark chapter 1, verse 22, the, 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 the multitude were astonished at the doctrine, the teaching of Jesus Christ because the Bible says he taught with authority and not as the scribes or those who were the writers, the journalists of his day. In Luke 4, 32, it says his words were with power in in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5, he makes very clear that the Word of God is not just in Word. It's also in the power of the Spirit of God. So effective ministry and effective churches are churches that emphasize the truth of God written in His Word, spoken by the Holy Ghost, whether it, be a, whether it be a prophetic utterance or whether it be any of the other ways that God communicates His message. Now, of course, we understand that the Scriptures are the foundation. And they're the blueprint that can never be broken. That's what Jesus said. The scriptures can never be broken. But we understand that God still communicates by the Holy Ghost. And that's how these men got their information through the Holy Spirit. It wasn't by parchment or literature. 
I mean, some of them did, obviously, but most of them got their, their information by revelation. That's excluding the history books. But we know where Moses got his information from. We know where Jesus got his information from. We know how Samuel got his information. They got these things from the Spirit of the Lord. Now, understand that that human knowledge is of no benefit when trying to discern spiritual things unless that human knowledge has been enlightened by the by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Worldly minded people will reject Jesus and his power. Understand that. If you're worldly minded, you're going to reject Jesus Christ. Jesus says, don't judge according to the appearance in, in John 7, 24. Judge not according to the appearance. Judge righteously. So you don't want to judge by how things look. In John 8, 15, told, he rebuked the Pharisees for judging only after the flesh, looking at a person's Physical reaction to power is not qualified as right judgment. In Acts 2, 12 and 13, they thought that the disciples who had just been newly baptized in the Holy Ghost were drunken because of their behavior. Their behavior was so strange to them. It looked obviously as though they were intoxicated. That's why they said that these guys are full of new wine. It wasn't like they were just standing all piously speaking these other tongues. And, and we'll get into tongues in the next video. But w what they were actually doing was they were speaking a heavenly language and the people around them understood about the Holy Ghost. Even though they didn't have the Holy Ghost, the, the Lord allowed them to be understood. It's like the Lord allowed his voice from heaven to be understood among men. God doesn't speak English. God doesn't speak Hebrew. God speaks God language and he allows man to understand it. In, with their own understanding. And so he allowed for automatic understanding. But a worldly minded person wouldn't understand that they're going to reject him. Physical reaction to power cannot determine the source or the quality of the power. Weeping can't tell you why. Laughing can't tell you why. Barking, well, I mean, that's kind of weird, but it can't necessarily tell you why. I may be barking as a joke. I may be barking, or I may sound like I'm barking. Oh, oh I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, but there are very many things that are going on in the earth, in the church, outside of the church that we want the Holy Ghost to reveal to us. The Bible says that when Hannah, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, when Hannah was vexed in her soul because she couldn't have a child, that she prayed to God so earnestly that her lips were moving, but there were no words. And the high priest, the high priest could not discern whether she was in the right or in the wrong. And he immediately judged that it was wrong and said, why are you drinking? You're drunk and you, you know, he let her know. He said, you know, you should put away the wine from you. How long are you going to be drunk? And she said, no, I'm not drunken. I'm not drunken. I'm vexed in my soul. So he judged her but based on the physical appearance and he came up wrong. Just like Samuel judged David's older brother immediately. Oh, this guy is obviously the next king, and God said, no, don't judge by the outward appearance. I look on the heart of the matter. And that's what God wants for you and I. In 1 Corinthians 14.32, it lets us know that when God inspires me, it's going to come out differently than when he inspires you. When we're talking about a worship setting or an act of devotion. Okay, because the spirits of the prophets are under the subjection of the prophets, meaning my personality can subdue an impulse, even if it's a mighty spiritual impulse, I can subdue it if I so choose. I don't have to get up and blurt out prophecy. I don't have to get up and blurt out tongues. The Holy Ghost does not possess a person in the, in the way that a demon does, even if my physical reaction to feeling his presence may look the same as though this guy's reaction to a false spirit. Hey, you have one body with your various spirits. And so the body is going to do what the body does in most of these situations. Paul, in Acts chapter, 7, Acts chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, he realized that a girl was under the demonic influence of a spirit. And even though her words were accurate, she was saying that Paul and Silas were servants of the Most High God. And that was true. But Paul discerned that there was an unclean spirit influencing her. So even though she looked orderly, or at least her words were right, but her soul, but the source was bad. And so you don't want to judge something by the external. It's the Holy Ghost that has to reveal it to you. Otherwise, which goes into our next point, which you might blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And if you do that, you do know in Matthew 12, but in Mark 3, 28 and 29 through 30, it says, 
all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost has never forgiveness, but it is in danger of eternal damnation, because the Pharisees said he casts out devils by demon power. So you definitely you don't want to prematurely judge any matter. You don't want to prematurely judge any matter, because if you judge it improperly, then it could cost your soul for eternity. Now, uh, let's look at the fact that many people out there have a form of religious posture, but you have to make sure that there's actually power attached to it. That was the nature of Jesus. That must be the nature of those who profess to follow him. Jesus says, uh, or Paul, through Paul, in addressing Timothy, he talks about those who have a form of godliness but deny the power. Don't let that be you. Tongues, it's for you. Prophecy, it's for you. Healing, it's for you. Miracles, it's for you. Discerning spirits, interpreting tongues, it's all for you. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, that's for you. Faith, it's for you. Believe that. That's what God wants for all of his people. Uh, Ephesians 4 describes that. And you may not have all the gifts when you have one, and then the other guy has another. It's for the body of Christ today. So the church is God's kingdom order. You don't want to separate yourself. You want to understand that God establishes order. He establishes accountability. He establishes the church as a community of love, truth, and mutual accountability. And to reject that is rebellion. If you have the opportunity to fellowship with believers with whom you can grow or who profess Christ and you reject that, you're rejecting the very the very thing Jesus promised to come back for, the gathered remnant who are submissive to his presence where two or three are gathered in his name. And so Proverbs 18 verse 1 it says, through desire, a man, having separated himself, seeks and intermeddles with all wisdom. And so one of the greatest ways that people out in Internet land get deceived is by being so separate and having access to all these various types of information. And they get to pick and choose from the Internet, buff internet buffet of spirituality. And of course, that's going to lead you to a lot of misconceptions about what's being said. It's going to also lead you to a lot of misconceptions as to what the, what Jesus wants you to know and who he wants you to be. And so I encourage everybody out there to aspire. Paul says to covet earnestly the best gifts. Aspire to grow in the nature of Jesus Christ. And if you do that, you'll see him move through you in a way that you never thought possible. But it is totally biblical and it's absolutely for everybody who takes the name of Jesus Christ.